A united Europe has been the centuries-old dream of politicians, statesmen, emperors, and dictators since the fall of Rome in 476 AD. But despite this, Europe has remained divided by language, culture, nationalism, and a turbulent history of war. Now the dream is becoming a reality as efforts are underway to forge the separate nations of Europe into a single political and economic giant, a third superpower. How will this United States of Europe affect the future of the world? The Worldwide Church of God presents The World Tomorrow. Each week, this program gives a unique understanding of the meaning behind today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. This week on The World Tomorrow, David Hume. Last week, in the first part of our two-part series, What Next for Europe?, we examined the continent's long, colorful, but often bloody history of the past 2,000 years. This week, we'll hear from some knowledgeable and prominent Europeans about how they see Europe's future. But as we proceed, keep this in mind. In the near future, a dramatic shift in the world's balance of power will occur. It'll affect the lives and livelihoods of nearly every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. The focal point of these profound changes will be Europe. We'll witness truly awesome geopolitical changes as Europe unites economically, politically, religiously, and even militarily. The contemporary map of Europe will be dramatically redrawn in the years just ahead. In the last program, we looked at the pivotal role played by the Roman Empire until its fall in 476 AD. We saw, too, that the dream of a unified European empire didn't die with it. Time after time, Europe has set out on the road back to unity, inspired by the ideal of the Roman Empire. History clearly validates what the prophet Daniel and the apostle John foretold centuries ago, that the Roman Empire would experience a series of resurrections or revivals down through the ages, culminating in our time in one final climactic union. The first revival began with Emperor Justinian in 554 AD. Later, Charlemagne, then Otto the Great, the Habsburg dynasty under Charles V, Napoleon's empire, and then the Italian dictator Mussolini, who proclaimed in 1936 another revival of the Roman Empire. Mussolini's short-lived experiment quickly crumbled along with Adolf Hitler's Third Reich. Speaking of the sixth revival by Mussolini, the Apostle John wrote in Revelation 17 and verse 10, There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and that's Mussolini, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. John prophesied another revival of the European dream yet to come. And that's the subject of today's program. After the calamity of World War II, the core nations of non-communist Europe slowly began to pick up the pieces. The suffering and destruction of World War II prompted many to ask how such a catastrophe might be avoided in the future. In a now celebrated speech in Zurich in September of 1946, Winston Churchill made this bold proposal. We must build, he said, a kind of United States of Europe. And Churchill emphasized, the first step in the recreation of the European family must be a partnership between France and Germany. That union began to take shape in 1950, when Robert Schuman, the French foreign minister, outlined a revolutionary scheme. He proposed that France and West Germany, and any other interested European countries, pool their coal and steel resources. Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg also decided to participate, making six nations in all. On March 25, 1957, the signing of the Treaties of Rome created the European Economic Community, the EEC, or Common Market. 
the EEC's immediate goal was to remove barriers on trade between the member states. But the ultimate aim was the creation of a United States of Europe or a European Union. With the launching of the common market, the economies of Western Europe took off. The 1960s in particular were boom years. Additional members, Britain, Ireland and Denmark, joined in 1973. Greece then followed in 1981, with Spain and Portugal being admitted to the community membership in 1986, making 12 nations in all. Back in 1972, the member nations had pledged themselves for the first time to achieve a more perfect but undefined European Union by 1980. However, global economic instabilities, leading to a prolonged recession in the next decade, upset the timetable. A condition known as Euro-pessimism set in. Something clearly was needed to propel Europe once again down the track to unity. At a 1985 Common Market Summit in Milan, the community heads of state acted to streamline the organization's decision-making process. And early last year at another summit, all 12 heads of state signed this document, the so-called Single European Act, an instrument which supersedes portions of the 1957 Treaty of Rome. The aim of the document is to transform relations among their states into a European Union. The Single European Act replaces, for the most part, the unanimous vote. In other words, the Act limits the veto power of individual nations to say no to new proposals they may not like. In addition, further power will be concentrated in the European Court and other institutions of the community. Where the European Court has jurisdiction, its decisions have precedence over the laws of the various national parliaments. A few individuals, especially in Britain, express reservations about the direction in which the community is headed. In London, our news editor, Gene Hogberg, asked noted historian Paul Johnson for his comments. Well, if you take the whole subject of uh, European unity, um, I think one has to balance the good against the bad. Uh, you have to remember, firstly, that Europe in the 20th century has fought two hideously destructive civil wars. And therefore, most of us support the notion of European unity in some sense. Uh, and in particular, we wanted to bring together France and Germany, whose enmities had been at the, at the heart of these two civil wars, European civil wars. And therefore, I think one must, uh, in some respects, uh, support the drive towards greater European unity. In my view, uh, statesmen like Conrad Adenauer and General de Gaulle of France uh, had the thing right in the sense they wanted European powers working together in friendship and amity and doing a lot of things in common, but they also wanted those states to preserve their essential national identity. General de Gaulle called it l'Europe des patries, the Europe of the fatherland. Uh, and he was strongly opposed to anything which would fundamentally undermine the sovereignty of his own country uh, or the sovereignty of other countries. Unfortunately, there are a number of people in Europe, particularly in the bureaucracy of the various European bodies, uh, and among those in the individual states which are, who are associated with them, who don't see it that way. They do want a European superstate and they are working towards it. And unfortunately, they control a lot of the mechanism uh, whereby the European community is administered and expands and changes itself. And they have introduced legislation along these lines which tends secretly to slide through the European parliaments without anyone taking very much notice. And the Single European Act is a case in point. Another individual who expresses concern about the new community legislation is Leo Price, a leading British lawyer. We asked him to explain his objections. Yes, the Single European Act, once part of our law as it now is, represents uh, a major step forward in the transfer of uh, governmental powers from Westminster uh, to the, uh, insti the governmental institutions of the common market, which are, in my view, and the view of most uh, uh, constitutional lawyers,
constitutionally irresponsible organizations. That is to say, they aren't like our parliament, responsible to the people from time to time in direct elections, but that merely confuses the ordinary Englishman who doesn't understand the situation. He believes that Parliament at Strasbourg has some of the qualities of Parliament at Westminster, and it has none. The real power of the European community, as Leo Price told us, lies in its Council of Ministers and the European Commission, the EC's vast bureaucracy. Now, of course, there are other Europeans who wouldn't agree with Mr. Price's assessment and who see no reason to hinder accelerated progress toward European unity. Dr. J.G. de Beurs, a distinguished former Dutch diplomat, as well as a former United Nations Assistant Secretary General, gave us his views as to whether there are any dangers in the growing concentration of power in the community. I see no dangers in it, no. In contrary, I think if we should still go forward faster. The builders, uh, Monet has always built the uh, United Europe in the idea that if we got more economic unity, it would automa automatically lead to greater political unity and military unity. And that remains the aim, I think, and remains necessary. No, I don't see, the, in some small countries, they're afraid of sort of hegemony of power by the big powers. But if you want to, big, to be a big power, you have to have somebody who decides. We asked Leo Price to reply to those who say that the single European Act is merely a logical next step along the road to the professed goal of a European Union. Well, we have conspicuously failed to define what is the union to which uh, the aspiration uh, expressed in the Treaty of Rome itself referred. Our Prime Minister, speaking in Parliament, said this. European Union is many different things to many different people. I must make it quite clear that I, that's Mrs. Thatcher, do not in any way believe in a federated Europe. The different understandings of different people about the union to which it apparently commits us is dangerous, mischievous, and as I think, truly absurd. But despite such objections, Europe is once again well along the path to unity. Political power is steadily draining from the individual common market members to a supranational authority. A leading member of Britain's House of Lords went so far as to say that Britain's sovereignty has already ended. We need to ask at this point, where is the movement toward a European Union really headed? What kind of a Europe will emerge in the years just ahead of us? Like the architects of a building, the original designers of the post-World War II concept of a united Europe might be surprised to see to what purpose their building is finally put. Before we continue, I want to offer you once again a new colorfully illustrated brochure, The History of Europe and the Church. It explores the history of the European dream much more fully than we have time for in one or two programs. The History of Europe and the Church examines Western civilization from a perspective most have probably never considered. This relationship between church and state has shaped the Western world. This brochure traces some very significant events in European history, from the height of the Roman Empire through its decline and fall in 476 AD, up to the present, and more importantly, on into the future. It goes on to explore the various revivals of that Roman system. Here's a chapter about Justinian, another on Charlemagne. It also shows the extent of the Habsburg Empire, Napoleon's conquests, and the most recent revival under Mussolini. The history of Europe and the Church also explains how Bible prophecy clearly predicts what will occur in Europe in the years just ahead of us. So be sure to request your free copy of The History of Europe and the Church. So now let's examine another aspect of the drive for European unity. The importance of the religious factor in the unification of Europe across the centuries is often overlooked today. Even committed Euro enthusiasts and hard-working Eurocrats concentrating on the day-to-day -day details of abolishing economic and political barriers to unity tend to dismiss this all-important factor in our so-called secular age. 
Yet others realize that a Europe without frontiers could be, in effect, a body without a soul if religion is excluded. Dr. de Beurs, whom we saw earlier, has spoken of the need of a spiritual impulse to awaken our culture. Of the importance of the role played by religion, he said this. No, it's very important because we have lost our original Christian faith and we've become a secularized society and now people start realizing what we have lost and then we have to go back in some way to a spiritual or religious uh, faith and values. Certainly a major proponent of European unity from the religious and cultural point of view has been Pope John Paul II. On numerous occasions, John Paul has appealed to the inhabitants of both Eastern and Western Europe to reclaim their religious heritage. During the well-publicized first trip to his native Poland as Pope in June of 1979, John Paul declared, Europe, despite its present and long-lasting division of regimes, ideologies, and economic systems, cannot cease to seek its fundamental unity and must turn to Christianity. Economic and political reasons cannot do it. We must go deeper. Speaking in Spain in 1982, the Pope cried out in his declaration to Europe, find yourself again, be yourself, discover your origins, revive your roots. Peter Nichols, Rome correspondent for the London Times, wrote in early 1984 concerning John Paul's efforts in the spiritual unification of Europe's peoples, more than a diplomatic plan, he has a vision. He has repeatedly spoken of Europe as stretching to the Urals. He sees his election as a sign that Eastern Europe must be given its just place as an integral part of Christian Europe. And, added to this vision, is a dream of reconciliation between Western Christianity and the Eastern Orthodox churches. So we plainly see that the drive for greater unity in Europe is proceeding on several fronts at the same time involving religion, economics, and politics. No analysis of Europe's current status would be complete without examining the role of the Soviet Union. The reform-minded government of Mikhail Gorbachev seems certain to make greater economic overtures to the European community. Moscow is probing the growing disaffection between Western Europe and the United States over trade and security matters. Some European strategists are suggesting that it would be better for Western Europe to shed its defense ties with the United States and enter into a security arrangement with Moscow instead. At the same time, some in the United States claim that the NATO alliance of nearly four decades should be dissolved. Most political observers today, including Dr. de Beurs, are extremely wary of going so far as to cut the transatlantic security linkage. I would be in favor, and many people would be in favor, of a stronger European defense unity within NATO, but definitely not separately uh, from NATO. Europe is not strong enough and not big enough and not rich enough, I think, to uh, compete with big units like the Soviet Union just in its own. Like in the long run, probably America wouldn't be. It's here again, the cooperation is essential for both parties, for the United States and Europe, and without each other, they cannot uh, withstand all the forces that are there now. But there are still other opinions about Europe's destiny. There are some who express a far different vision of the future. In Belgium, we talk with Jean Thiriard, long and outspoken advocate of what he calls a unitary Europe, a powerful, centralized, single European nation state, standing apart from the United States, but increasingly linked with the power of the Soviet Union. A prominent Brussels professional, Thiriard's real passions are European history and the unification of Europe. He's written a number of books as well as over 250 articles on these subjects. Conversing in French, our European correspondent, Olivier Carrion, asked Jean Thiriard why, 30 years after the treaties of Rome, Europe still has not succeeded in its quest for unity. We have seen the democratic system arise out of an existing nation, but never create one. The ability of the current politicians is extremely weak. They are barely able to lead their small national states. How can you expect them to make Europe? Jean Thiriard's conception of the geopolitical extent of a future European power 
is a far-reaching one indeed. But at the same time, elements of it harken back to the Roman Empire. I do not conceive any more of a Europe apart from the Soviet Union. And a Soviet Europe must form the super great power and not be a Europe between two superpowers. We must take the next step immediately and wish for a Europe from Vladivostok to Dublin, all in one block. Just as the Urals are not a border, neither is the Mediterranean. On the contrary, we consider it a lake, and we cannot conceive of making a historically viable Europe without including North Africa. That was the scheme of the Roman Empire of Charles V much later, five centuries ago, and Europe, without control of all coasts of the Mediterranean, is not conceivable, militarily speaking. We asked John Tyriar whether a united Europe, in his view, would need to have its own military force, complete with nuclear weapons. It's inconceivable that Europe would not have its own nuclear weaponry, and especially its own nuclear decision. It is the first condition for the existence of a European nation state. A state without an army does not exist. And an army without atomic weapons does not exist either. Most people believe that a united Europe would continue to be an ally of or a partner with the United States. Jean Thiria, once again, is of a different opinion. One could, if need be, imagine a united Europe with friendly or good relations with the United States. This is not out of the question, but in that case it's a European Sixth Fleet which must sail in the Mediterranean. We do not want to see a single U.S. aircraft carrier nor a single submarine in the Mediterranean anymore. We shall be our own rulers in our own home. Friendly or serious relations with the U.S. are possible as long as we take our destiny in our own hands. For the United States, the real unification of Europe would be a disaster because an enormous competitor would appear on the world scene. I'm sure not many of you have thought of the unification of Europe in such a context. Now, while we do not endorse Jean Thiriot's views, we do need to let you know that such opinions exist. Though now his viewpoints appear extreme and attract virtually no one, stranger things have happened. Today, many Americans don't tend to think of Europe as a major power block. But it has been historically just that. Indeed, it has been the power. The model of the Roman Empire has persisted and inspires men still. Belgian novelist Alexis Curve puts it this way. My position is very simple. I am a citizen of the ancient Roman Empire. I like Europe and its civilization, which is the civilization. Nostalgia for the Roman Empire centers on peace as well as on power. The Pax Romana, or peace under the Roman Empire, is also a motivating factor for some Europeans. When Rome ruled, a man could travel from Spain to Turkey, from London to the Nile, without danger and without crossing a single border. Such a reconstituted modern Roman Empire would aim at solving the problems of the Middle East as it did in earlier times. Now these could be said to be unconventional views, at least for the moment. But they show once again that the dream or the model of the Roman Empire still lives on. Who can tell which view of Europe's destiny will prevail in the future? We are heading into extremely uncertain times. Danger signs are everywhere, all around us, including in the relationship between Western Europe and the United States. There are tensions over trade, which could eventually spill over into a real trade war. Syria, for one, hopes a major world crisis, and it would most probably be economic, could be used to shock Europe into greater unity. He says a crisis is absolutely necessary. The Bible does speak of a time of crisis at the close of this age. And now, O Daniel, keep all this a closed secret, and keep the book shut as a secret, till the crisis at the end. Ere then, many shall give way, and trouble shall be multiplied on earth. We could be on the verge of a series of events leading to that time. For a real understanding of where all of this is leading, you need to request your free copy of this brochure, The History of Europe and the Church. To understand the future, you must come to see how Europe fits into the roadmap of prophecy. This free brochure 
will help you grasp the overall sweep of European history. It shows how each successive revival of the Roman Empire fulfilled Bible prophecy. This fully illustrated brochure is extremely well researched and will give you a thorough background to this important subject. From the Habsburgs to Napoleon and Mussolini, you'll be able to trace the history of Europe in easy to understand sections. Now on The World Tomorrow, you hear many things you don't hear on other programs. And one of the things you'll never hear on this program is a request for money or contributions. Everything we offer is free in the public interest. All you need to do is go to the telephone and for the cost of a local call, please telephone 008-074-222. That's 008-074-222. And request the history of Europe and the church. We have many operators waiting, but if you don't get through right away, call us again in 10 or 15 minutes. That's 008-074-222. I'd also like to offer you a free subscription to the Plain Truth magazine. This monthly magazine complements and expands topics we cover on The World Tomorrow, and it's also free of charge. In addition to in-depth articles about prophecy, the Plain Truth gives you information about how to have a happy marriage, how to combat drug abuse, how to lead a healthy life. So for a free subscription to the Plain Truth, and this free brochure, The History of Europe and the Church, please telephone 008-074-222. That's 008-074-222. Or if you prefer, you may write to The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. That's The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Next week, Richard Ames will discuss one of the greatest scourges of our modern society, crime. Over the past several decades, the rate of crime has risen alarmingly, reaching epidemic proportions. No matter where you live, no matter what your economic status, chances are you will become a victim of crime. Why, at a time of increasing prosperity, has crime become such a rampant problem? Don't miss next week's program, Why Crime? Thank you for joining us today. I'm David Hume for The World Tomorrow. For the free literature offered on this program, write The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Or for the cost of a local call, please telephone 008-074-222. That's The World Tomorrow, GPO Box 345, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001. Or for the cost of a local call, please telephone 008-074-222. The preceding program and all literature were produced and sponsored by the Worldwide Church of God.